Welcome everyone to the New Fly Fisher. In this very special episode, we're focused on learning the basics of European nymphing, also referred to as tight line nymphing. Joining us is Jesse Haller from Vermont, who's a passionate fan and instructor of this style of fly fishing. We're on the Farmington River in Connecticut, fly fishing for trout and learning about this super deadly way of being successful, even in tough conditions. Stay with us for this truly educational learning experience. Today we've traveled to beautiful Connecticut in early October to fish the famous Farmington River. Usually this is a perfect time for fishing the Farmington as water levels should be low and quite reasonable. But unfortunately, the region was hit with a major sustained rainfall days before we arrived and storm systems continue to blow through the region. The river is high and somewhat murky, very tough conditions for any angler. Thankfully, we're here to learn about European nymphing, also known as tight line nymphing from Jesse Haller. Jesse is helping me to understand the principles of this deadly type of nymph fishing, which is becoming increasingly popular throughout North America. Jesse is a product development specialist with Orvis and has been a major force with the company for developing European nymphing products. Jesse is also on the board of directors for AFTA and is passionate about the growth of fly fishing in America. I'm very excited to spend the next several days with this exceptional angler. So Jesse, here we are, we're on the Farmington River. A really nice run, there's some other anglers down below us, but you're gonna teach me a technique which yep. you know I've been hearing about for years. It's another tool to have in the toolkit. Can you talk to me about this and what's the type of fishing we're gonna be doing? Well, this European style nymphing technique uh, has been a really popular technique as, as of recent, simply because it's an extremely effective way to nymph. And the reason why it's really effective is that it uses heavier flies and light tippet. And what that does is allows us to penetrate the water column much faster, get our flies into the strike zone and give ourselves more opportunity. The more time in the strike zone, the more time at the cafe, the more time to get you know an opportunity to get some food. This technique also allows us to stay in relatively close contact with our flies, unlike a suspension device or an indicator where we're actually creating some slack in between the indicator and the flies below, as well as slack in between our rod and our indicator. We're running under just under tension right now with this rig, and that allows us to instantly register what's going on with our flies down below. So if fish are a little more finicky and they touch the fly, we're gonna know about it through the cider. Well, I think one of the first things we talk about that's really important are the tools that we're going to be using to do this. And you just mentioned a cider. So can you explain what the tools are to get started here? So typically, uh, you'll see a lot of people use a three-weight rod in this situation, but a 10-foot three-weight rod. It could be 10 and a half foot, 11 foot, um, but the three-weight seems to be this kind of sweet spot. And the way these rods are actually designed is they have a very sensitive tip, a pretty sensitive mid, and a nice strong butt section. Why this tool is so great is it creates a lot of tip sensitivity, and when we're tapping along the bottom with our flies, it allows us to register what's going on underneath. And once you've kind of dialed in the technique, you'll actually feel the flies ticking on the bottom, which gives you the kind of next level of sensitivity that uh, you don't necessarily get with a suspension device. The longer rod helps a lot with reach and kind of getting across. As you can see, it's a relatively decent sized piece of water on right here. And because we're typically fishing a little bit closer to ourselves and not throwing a suspension device out there and mending to it, we typically work a little bit closer. So the extra length of the rod does help quite a bit with, you know, manipulating the flies over complex currents and keeping them in straight paths. So you were saying before, like typically you're going to fish out like twice the length of the rod. At most. At most, right. like 20. Yeah. So you're inside of 20 feet. You know, two times the length of the rod is really the maximum. We may try to stay right under our rod tip as much as possible. That allows us to be much more in control of what's going on. The further we get away, that's a little bit less uh, easy to control. So the closer we stay in, the higher the ability to, to dissect the water in much smaller portions, like gridding off the water and working small portions, versus kind of throwing something out there and hoping you're in the right spot, never really knowing exactly where your flies are. This technique, and with the leading of the flies, allows us to really stay in those small channels and really effectively cover water. The leader you're using here, I mean, it's kind of unique. You've got uh, some cuttered 
uh, line up here. And it's a fairly long one. You've got a tag, you've got, so you're using a two-fly system, obviously mm -hmm. legal here in Connecticut. What is the general rule for the leaders? Well, you can kind of break a European nymphing leader down into two sections, kind of your upper leader, and then your slider, and then your lower leader. There's a million different formulas in the world on, on how you build your upper leader. Very simply, you can use a, a 9 foot 2x or a 9 foot 0x leader, and then you're going to attach about an 18 to 24 inch piece of cider material, which is the colored monofilament that you noted. That's our kind of strike indicator, if you will. It it's also really gives us a good idea what's going on with, with our flies. We can follow our cider down, and it tells us where our flies are. Below that, I have a tippet ring tied on, a 2 millimeter stainless steel ring, and that's just for ease of rigging. Uh, it ends up the cider material and then starts a piece of uh, fluorocarbon tippet below it. That fluorocarbon tippet below it is all one diameter. Um, and that helps a lot with helping the sink rate. Here you have 5X tippet material on, so that should sink relatively fast combined with the heavier tungsten flies you're gonna put on below. As you come down the tippet material, there's a tag end where we use a double surgeon's knot to create about a, a smaller four to six inch tag, and then 18 to 20 inches uh, of the remaining material so you can put two flies on it. One of the biggest problems I have when I'm indicator fishing, whether it's for steelhead on a Great Lakes tributary or it's on a trout river like this, mm -hmm. is that the indicator, what's happening at the top, yeah. the water flow, mm -hmm. versus what's happening down below, yeah. is completely different speeds, and Absolutely. I know the velocities are impacting my presentation, and this gives me a lot more time in the kill zone, as yes. we call it, or the eating zone, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Can you explain a little bit about that, what that velocity change does, and what, what the advantages of what we're doing here compared to using an indicator? Absolutely. As If we were to kind of cross-section a piece of river, looking at our top flow, kind of the middle, and all the way down to what we're calling the strike zone or the kill zone down there on the bottom, they would be moving at different velocities. The top is typically almost some of the fastest water, and as you come down just a, just a little bit, that's basically the fastest portion of the river. So we need to make sure we get through that top portion as fast as we can because the bottom part is considerably slower. When you know you're in the strike zone, as you're watching the bubbles move much faster than your strike indicator or your cider material. And that's already telling you that your flies are moving much slower uh, than what's going on on the surface of the water. This technique with the weighted flies and the thin tippet really helps it get down simply because the thinner the diameter of the material, the faster that it'll sink. And certainly with that top portion of the river, we want to really get down as fast as we can through that. With a traditional leader, you have a much thicker butt section up there on the top. And that's considerably faster than the bottom. So with a traditional leader with that thick butt section, that's going to get caught up in that faster water much easier because it's a much thicker diameter material. With using one single diameter like we are today with 5X, um, that'll get through that much faster, not to mention it'll also be much more resilient as the current pulls on it and keeping our flies lower in the water column and much more in the strike zone. just start wherever I mean it's there's only you know a few defining characteristics throughout the you yeah. know the stretch here look you're kind of looking for yeah look at that pan there it keeps yeah. coming up there's a there's some rocks there yeah so, yeah so for the cast um, it's not all too different from how you would traditionally cast one of the challenges that people kind of first kind of come across when they start fishing this is just simply that we have a long leader we have a thin fly line and we have some heavy flies on the end um, we may choose to just come and do a traditional kind of forward cast, just being a little bit more patient for uh, allowing the flies to come front and back. And once we've kind of set our distance, and we've kind of said this is the distance we're gonna fish within, towards the end of the drift, mm -hmm. rather than coming straight back up and just doing another forward cast, we may choose to just simply do a, a flip cast, in mm -hmm. which case we're just gonna kind of point, bring it forward, and there we go, and we're back in the game. The rod tip basically leads the, the, the line, right? That is there correct, is. yeah. So, with the drift, unlike a you know traditional infrared or an indicator rig where we might actually you know lay some slack on the water, we're going to keep our line up. We're going to have just a little bit of uh, sag in the line. Notice how there's just a little bit of uh, sag in the cider material, and you'll notice it ticking the bottom every once in a while. Get down to about right there. That's about the end of your drift. If you go much further, you're actually going to start pulling your flies closer to the bank. It's going to cause a little bit of drag. So you're fishing about 45 up and maybe 25 down. So a little bit kind of 
Kind of like that, not a full 90, 70 degrees, let's call it. But that whole drift, you're pretty much on the bottom, the whole That's correct, distance, absolutely. Right? So with that, the light tippet material and that he those heavy flies, it allows us to get down pretty quick. And I'm simply just leading that cider, maybe collecting a little bit of slack, kind of leading it down, just staying right in front of it. So the second, we'll just try to get snagged here, you can see the cider want to stop the second that it makes contact with the bottom. And what are you looking for in terms of a strike? I mean, you're going tick, 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 and all of a sudden, thunk or a stop, right? So the cider does resonate a whole lot because we're leading in front of it. The second that something happens, it'll resonate through the cider, through a tick or a stop or whatever. Um, sometimes it's a very aggressive shot forward that's very clearly fished. Sometimes it's just a stop in the cider that will just indicate that a fish is eaten and they may not as, as aggressively take as, as in some situations. So as we're leading the flies, we really want to make sure that we're not pulling them too fast. That's why we kind of look for that subtle drape in the line. We don't want it to be completely taut. We simply want to just stay in front of it. If we're moving too fast, you'll notice that the cider stays really tight. That means we're probably pulling our flies a little bit too fast. If we go too slow, our cider will kind of start to loop underneath us and we'll actually lose sensitivity with the flies. So what we are trying to do is just match that current flow and just let that cider be just under tension and wait. And you should be able to feel slight resonance of the bottom through the rod. And certainly the, leader, the cider material will tell you if anything does happen. So we've had a couple emerging insects and a few rises. So I switched over to a couple soft tackles. I'm just popping it along just off the bottom, trying to give a little bit of a movement with some soft tackles. And it did just uh, induce a strike. So we're gonna try to continue doing that and see if that does anything as we kind of work back across this water where we saw some fish earlier. The rain kept coming down off and on throughout the day. Despite this and the rising water, I was learning a great deal from Jesse about the techniques for European nymphing. We're in a little bit deeper water here, so I'm fishing with a little bit more weight, trying to get my flies down into that lower part of the river. So casting just a little bit further than I normally would. Once those flies set up, I'm just simply leading my rod right out in front of the flies, uh, really carefully trying to match that current speed. I'm doing a little bit of hand tending here as the flies come down the stream at me. And that allows me to keep my rod at a good hook setting position. Uh, if I move my rod too much, I actually lose a lot of my hook set, so I don't have as much power. But if I tend my line, right here, just very carefully as I'm moving the rod slowly, I can preserve a lot of the hook setting power as it comes down the river. The other great thing about the cider material is that because everything's in a straight line, if I was looking down my cider, I know my flies are following right down that, so I know exactly which part of the river my flies are coming down. So when I reset, if I want to move a little bit further out, I just simply go out a little bit further and that cider will tell me, yep, I am a little bit further out. So I'm not covering the same water, but really breaking down the water into a much smaller portion, thus covering the water much better. So when you look at a run kind of similar to what we're fishing here, uh, you know, I got a quick glance. It's relatively uniform. What we try to do is break it down into grid and uh, we might take our casting distance, maybe 15, 20 feet out in front of us, uh, and kind of pick that as our lane, and uh, kind of just work our way uh, out into the river fishing that lane. And with this technique, again, we can be relatively precise with where we're uh, casting and where our flies are. So we may kind of choose a, a little lane, a little bubble line, and we're gonna work that. Once we feel like we've covered that bubble line well enough, or that six inches, or that 12 inches really well, we're just gonna take that next little lane that looks pretty good and start running cast down that. And then 
simply wade out a little bit further and try to keep that lane kind of coming straight across the river. And once you get to a point where either you can't wade enough or you don't want to disturb that far water, maybe you'll come back and fish from the other bank. You'll come back, slide upstream another 20 feet or so, 25 feet, so you're kind of creating a new section. And then fish that the, exactly like we were talking about, just going right down that lane, picking all those little micro seams and kind of coming out, just gritting the water, allowing you to really effectively cover all the water. And if we fished a lane and didn't have a lot of action, we may make some subtle adjustments like fly weight, fly selection, uh, tippet diameter uh, to improve our opportunity maybe on the next lane. We were fortunate to be able to find accommodations literally right on the river during our stay. Legends on the Farmington River has become well known to anglers for their wonderful accommodations and convenient location on some of the best trout waters in the region. It's a great sportsman lodge for families, friends, and even large groups. During the remainder of the day and into the night, we were hit with another downpour of rain and the river went from a normal 540 CFS to 1700 CFS, the true meaning of tough conditions. But I had faith that Jesse would be able to put us on some fish and use European nymphing techniques to catch trout, even in these high water conditions. On our second day, Jesse and I were joined by professional guide and orbit shop manager, Ed Fowler. Ed is a consummate angler and passionate about the Farmington River. Best of all, he's a really funny and entertaining person to spend the day with. <laughs> so normal flows, uh, most people will kind of fish this pool, trying to get out toward the tree over here and that far bank. But when the water comes up like this, you'll kind of see that softer water up here on the left and most of the fish will actually slide up onto this kind of gravel and sand where Jesse's fishing here. And it's, and it's a great opportunity to capitalize on some of those bigger fish. We got the high water going on right now. Uh, try to go to the high water game, get some heavy flies, something that they could see, larger protein snack. So we went with a large kind of crayfly caddis larva imitation called the mop. Um, nice big protein looking fly get their attention. Yeah, right? Oh, that's a good one. There we go. Right. There he is. Nice. Nice. Good fish. Yep. There we go. Uh, just kind of prospecting across it, gritting off that water, trying to find, uh, kind of work through the fish. All right. Pretty little fish. Like every sport, fly fishing has its innovations, and right now, one of the biggest, the most productive, is European style nymphing. Fly fishermen in Czechoslovakia, Poland, and France perfected Euro nymphing, 
and today anglers throughout North America are learning to embrace this style of fishing. So why should you try it out the next time you hit the water? It's really quite simple, because Euro nymphing is absolutely one of the best and most effective means of breaking down sections of a river and allowing you to fish virtually every inch of it. As Jesse Holler has taught me these past two days, once you get the hang of European nymphing, not only will you learn all the small differences on a river's bottom, but more importantly, you'll become a far more effective and successful angler. We hope you enjoyed this episode and our thanks to Jesse Howler for helping us learn more about this wonderful means of fishing. Take care and we hope to see you on the water soon. Hi, I'm Tom Rosenbauer. For videos like the one you just saw and more, subscribe to our channel. You don't want to miss our weekly uploads of educational videos, exciting trips and much more.